Hello and welcome to Crackcast 286. This is Ozone Ocean and with me is the lovely Tan Serene. Hello, Tance. Hello. And the brave and uh, handsome Mr. Baines. Hello, Mr. Baines. Hello, dears. <laughs> Hello, a camp as ever. So we're going to be talking about causing offence. So we don't want to be too camp in our uh, portrayals here, or else it would be seen as causing offence. <laughs> so yeah, the, the idea of the idea is: uh, Do you have to be careful about? Um, you know what you write uh do you worry about offending specific people with your writing where's the line between honest expression and regard for other people's feelings so it's it's a complex one especially these days when people talk about uh trigger warnings and and all sorts of um gender issues and and you know old ideas about that the racist and sexist are going by the wayside and, and we got to you know keep up with the times and, and not be dicks about it so, um, before we get into that... Or maybe we do need to be dicks about it. We don't know. We'll yeah, see. perhaps. We'll yeah. Baines is going to be the, the politically incorrect person here. He's going to be the, the Donald Trump of the quack cast. <laughs> It'll be a fantastic quack cast. <laughs> it's going to be a great deal. It's going to be a great deal, a fantastic quack cast. And you're going to be like it is. very happy with it. Yes. Exactly. With his perfectly normal size quack hands. cast has been rigged. Quackcast is rigged. <laughs> oh, it's a left wing quackcast. It's still rigged against you. <laughs> before we get into that, we've we've got to mention the um the uh, featured comic, which is read out by Kwai, and it's called Military Variant. And yeah, so Kwai is going to read that one out. It's uh, it's about military stuff. And great artwork too, very comic-y cartoony. So here you go, Quiet. Hello, this is Quiet Agatse, and the feature I've selected for this week is Military Variant by GD Tone, and it is rated E for everyone. Military Variant is an honest portrayal of military life from an infantry marine during the post-9-11 years. The comic follows a slice-of-life comic strip format from the perspective of Detone, who was only 18 years old, when he decided to enlist because he wanted his life to have adventure and to do something greater than himself. The comic takes you on a journey from boot camp, the early days of the School of Infantry, experiencing deployment life abroad, returning home with less employment prospects, and PTSD. There is an entire art series in the comic that pays tribute to fallen servicemen. In truth, this comic is a very important body of work because it creates a human connection to an infantryman. The art is drawn with pretty stylistic solid colors. In some pages, the art transforms to look more realistic with feathery brushstrokes when the subject matter gets more serious. The comic is shown in full color pages and in full color. If you're ever curious about the day-to-day life, conflict, and struggles of an infantry marine, then you will find what you are searching for right here. Please check out Military Variant by GD Tone, rated E. And that was Kwai with the military variant, or military as we say in Australia. I think Americans say military. <laughs> or something. <laughs> they, they like to pronounce all the, uh, the, the consonants and the syllables in a very um, obvious way. Yeah. Defense, offense. <laughs> <laughs> military. Um, so... After that, we have the featured uh, music by Mr. Gum Wallace, and he's given us the feature for the comic Gemini. Gemini! And I. Gemini! Criminy. Gemini, yeah. Maybe that's a better pronunciation. Gemini? Gemini. How did, how did you. I said Gemini, so I've got no idea. Gemini, it is. Oh. And the music is, is um, quite. Uh, it's a real classic funk rock tune, basically. It's very danceable. It's got a, this a repeating um, riff kind of thing over and over, you know, really good rhythm that, that repeats over and over and over. And it's, um, But it's got a real kind of funk, classic funk sound to it. So enjoy Sweet. the classically funky sound of... Uh, Shake everything you got. <laughs> Shake everything you got. Shake everything you got. Chimney! Shake everything you got. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> Thank you. 
And that was Gemini. I, I, I would naturally think that's Gemini, but it can't be Gemini because it's got too many ends in it. So it has to be Gemini. Gemini? Gemini Cricket. I don't know. It's but, really, it's really uh, making you puzzle over this, isn't it? <laughs> it is. I puzzle over everything like that. It's, I haven't got a big enough brain to take in these things. It's, it's not understandable to, for me I, I will just be confused forever and speaking of being confused by things things that cause offence <laughs> wow not a good segue <laughs> yeah I, I think when when Look people that. write stuff that, that causes offence they don't realise often they don't sometimes people will deliberately write to cause offence but often people do it um, without realizing because they're still clinging to older ideas and they don't realize the world has moved on and you know things have changed and we no longer you know say certain words or refer to certain groups in certain ways and you know certain things aren't funny anymore but you know the modern world is confusing yeah. to these people so <laughs> they, they cling to these old ideas and it moves uh, quickly especially with the connection of and the sort of uh, voice that's given to everyone with our uh current you know technology and all that kind of stuff like that kind of thing can really yeah, yeah Twitter quickly a... spread sort of, yeah that's very true people can get on to Twitter and they can uh, really um, and Tumblr I think that's the that's one of the big ones and they can really um, like pile on to people who are seen as uh, transgressing a bit too far and mm -hmm. yeah but but we're not talking about the culture of offence. We're talking about writing and causing it. Um, what about you guys? Do you, do you, have, a, do you have a problem in, with causing offence in your writing? Or do you have to sort of think carefully about how you write in order not to... Uh, hmm. I mean, Turn to you me? You <laughs> oh, I got... It's a draw. It's a draw. Yeah. Um, offending, uh, it has crossed my mind, like, sort of not wanting to offend specific people. I'm talking actual specific people who I know. Uh, if they would see something that seems to be based on them or something that's based on what they think my opinion must be, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, if I wrote it in the comments, and, and they took it to mean that I, I didn't like them or I had a negative opinion of them personally. Um, definitely, I, I've thought about that. I think the, the greater risk is is doing it when you, without even realizing it. Like say, that's a good comic. Point, yeah. It says that you know, like oh, that's what you think of me. I think mine are camouflage enough. My close friends, most of them don't. I don't tell people about my comic anyway. I keep my comic book friends. Um, but know about the stuff I've done and uh, people who are close enough to me I, I tell them when someone's based on them because it's all based on an extremely immature version of them like I sort of take their temperament but they take away all of their self-awareness and coolness and like the stuff that makes me actually like them is sometimes minimized and the sort of character quirks and this sort of um, usual things about them or even their flaws or whatever are kind of exaggerated. Just made, I guess, less ma less mature in the fictionalized version to make it more entertaining. And people who know me don't really have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. um, I would be, have to be careful of my mom. Not your critic, like, like our mothers are for a lot of us, but I know that she would be... Uh, I wouldn't want to hurt her feelings. So as I introduce characters' mothers in my upcoming issues, I'm going to have to be careful because that stuff is coming. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not based on my mom, but if there's a character's mom, I know if my mom happens to read it, she will. She could take it personally. So yeah. this is going to be the tightrope I'm walking. I'm glad we're doing this quack cast. <laughs> <laughs> Pulling you off a bit, yeah. What about you, Tance, um, with offending? Because you, 
touch on some pretty uh you know some universal issues there you know things that could be offensive uh very touchy subjects you know war and what people do in yeah. war and have done in war and racial stuff and all sorts of um, things. there are some things i remember like i don't always think about it like they said uh there are long sequences where I don't think I mean I don't suspect at least that someone is going to get offended yeah um, but I remember when I was designing the language so to speak of, of without moonlight like how the people would talk there are some ways some terms of phrases that there existed back then on all all sides like um, like for this language 1940s language in general that would be extremely it's tougher uh, they were tougher uh, back then right yeah, it would be abrasive if you if you actually had them talk especially when you know emotional charge and stuff um, now and uh, considering that uh, during the war there were a lot of pejorative terms and, uh, and a lot of uh, expressions that even got printed like on big headlines in newspapers and stuff like that, that would uh, be appalling even to, uh, you know, the right-wingers right now. Um, mm. So I think, uh, I mean, I remember that I specifically um, designed a little bit of a code on some things that I would use to signal, you know the emotions, the colors of every character, and where they would, uh, they, where they fall on the spectrum of um, of the times. But there was a lot that I decided to just not use. For example, um, back then during the the occupation in Greece, there, there weren't Nazis; there were just Germans. But if I could, if I um, trans transcribed that language and, and had everything, you know, everyone referring to the Germans as we now refer to the Nazis, that would be offensive to Germans right now, who are not obviously, mm. you know, Nazis. <laughs> um, Nazis. So I had, I had to make a very specific uh, cut and and you would notice, I mean, if, if you didn't, I'm, I'm glad, but it's not very obvious, um, that they never say the Germans when they really want to talk about, you know, Nazis being evil and, and stuff like that. They always say Nazis. Yeah, okay. Whereas, yeah. historically, they wouldn't. They would yeah. Because uh, at the time, it wasn't like the particular movement that, that made this effect. In uh, current events and in uh, general language, it was just, you know, war between specific countries, and that was that. Was that. Yep. Um, so that was one thing that I was very to weigh what would be okay, what would take away from what I wanted to show and people would focus only on that, you know, things like that. And even then I had problems that I didn't expect uh, on uh, what I depicted. And um, um, that would be really interesting. I mean, the insights that I had on what people would believe from what, that time, whether it was historical fact or not, doesn't matter, but what they would believe displayed um, had a specific um, level and beyond that in order to make people even entertain the particular uh, reality of the times you would need to cultivate it differently in order to be to introduce it to an audience that isn't aware of certain things. So that that was uh, very. I mean, that was my type tightrope initially, mm -hmm. and um, even and that's why I took so much time before I started breaching the stuff like uh, kids be killing other kids or um, mm -hmm. other stuff that uh, that mm -hmm. uh, is going to come. And for example, um, how would you respond to to a lynching? Yeah. Uh, um, I, I can start the story with that. Nobody will focus on the story. They will focus on the shock value. Yeah, that that's, all they would, that yeah. that's all they would pay attention to. Yeah. Very good point. 
and you also had to um this is something I, I talked just briefly to uh to pitface about with the um um brave resistance you have the uh an american you know native american character in that and there's a lot of sensitivity involved in the depiction of a native american character oh yeah in a way that's that not was, uh, cliche thing. Or, yeah um uh, in brave resistance uh we we had the three-way title because hunter is native american and you you don't want to depict uh, native americans like uh Elves, in a sense, you know, very or otherworldly, different mentality people that are part of reality, and they were very real and still are, of course, yeah. uh, integrated in a sense, like not they they are segregated uh, socially in in some aspects, but they are modern people in a modern world. Well. So that took a lot of research, and then from that research, what would we show and how would we show it? Like, Hunter is only now starting to talk a little bit about us as a Seneca yeah. Indian. Uh, like, it took something like 70 pages before we felt that, okay, now we can have him start to drop little hints and stuff. And, and the bigger part of his his identity and, and his history and what has made him him, uh, what he is, will come in the second act, which is like after this story ends and, you know, the second part of this story, yeah. which is being set up right now. Now, if we live and if we are, you know, we are not 80 years old, we are going to make it. Um, so, yeah, that, that is, uh, and of course we don't want to offend any actual Native American person reading it. We want them to to feel that we are making effort, at least, to depict something true yeah. to to the act, in a sense. Yeah, not going. I'm rambling. Your... I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. You, basically, you're not going with the. No, know, that's good. The stereotype idea of um, yeah, the uh, the noble savage kind of uh, magical yeah. person. You know the. Um, the, those horrible old cliches that people use, you know, when they have a black person in in a movie, they they are the the so called magical Negro. You know, um, uh, Morgan Freeman always always plays that that character. Well, almost in movies, you know, the driving Miss Daisy sort of character. That's uh, terribly terribly cliche. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we really didn't want that. We didn't want that about him. I mean. Yeah. And um, he is a great, he's a great tracker, and uh, this is going to show like in the next couple of pages or so. But that doesn't make him a forest whisperer, in a sense. <laughs> uh, he's, mm. he's, a, he's human, <laughs> um, right? You know that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. It has to be in order to feel that okay, I will not offend. Because we didn't want to offend. Um, that that can be a bit of a balance, and then you are not really sure that you got it all the, all the time. You know yeah. that yeah, sort you of. Can't, thing. You can't be sure. Even but... even the hue of his skin, the hue of his skin was an issue. I mean, we had like uh, three, four different hues of of Hunter's skin as as tone <laughs> before we settled on on how dark or light he would be. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> that is tricky. Um, I had that with um, we were doing that scene swap idea that we came up with on the crack cast a while ago, and I was putting um Pinky into the um the comic uh, Steel and Manitou, and she took the role of this the Native American character there, and so I had to do like a Native American version of Pinky. You know, well, not Native American, Aboriginal Canadian. I suppose they they say. I'm not sure. What? What? See, I, I'm not. Try, I'm trying not to cause offence here. And I don't know the term. First, <laughs> first indigenous nation. person, or we, First Nations. Yeah, exactly. First Nations. Yeah. So the, that doing a, a version of Pinky in that way without making her, and I'm just doing you know two pages that are someone else's thing originally. Um, 
and trying to do pinky as that thing and even there you know yeah i'm thinking in a way and trying to make it not offensive and not um cliched and it's just a depiction i'm not even mm. writing her not even giving her a, a character in there i'm just drawing her and as you say with the skin color and all that kind of thing not trying to you know make so yeah the, those are things you you do have to think about isn't it and yeah you could just go and, and do a cliche you know just throw caution to done the that and like do it. literally a russian espionage operative who likes speaks in broken English is sort of made, you know. I don't know. I don't know if it was advised to do that or if someone could be offended by that potentially. I think that uh, because it was, I mean, it was comedy, right? And It's a kind of a cliche on purpose. Yeah, there's a context. Like, of course, uh, you will use the stereotypical elements of of the type of character when you want to play it for laughs or you want to make um, uh, to make a point for example yeah and cliches help you right. people understand things they, they're, they're like um, like shortcuts into helping people mm-hmm. get the point straight away without having to set things up too much like quote, almost. yeah, yeah. yeah. Because yeah, we all know those things. That's why they're cliches. Right. But they're not necessarily always offensive. Like a, a cliche depiction of Australian, you know, doing the Paul Hogan sort of thing, you know, grey mate sort of, you know, crap, all that. <laughs> That's not offensive. That's just a cliche. So you know, an, right. an American talking with a Texan accent and having a big cowboy hat and everything like that. That's not offensive. No, <laughs> I mean none not of us necessarily. Are I mean, uh, I think it's question. It could be. Asked. I mean, I'm sort of thing with mine. Like I was sort of having fun with the cliche and sort of mixing that, you know, spy cliche with my comedic characters. Um, it could be seen as like laughing at that person. I could see someone interpreting it that way, with her, her being unfamiliar with the culture that she's in and a sort of um, the broken English that's broken in a way that doesn't really make sense. Although it sounded accurate sometimes to someone who speaks English as a second language. But I, yeah. I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was mocking those people or mocking that person. You know, this person ended up being pretty strong, a pretty strong character, a villain in a way, but a strong character. Not someone I was looking down at, I think. Although I could, I could understand someone possibly be offense. It's po- definitely possible. Yeah, I think that the way you treat the character. I mean, supposedly you make a very stereotypical character, but maybe the way the story treats the character is is whether there will be offense or not. Because if the character is presented in a light that shows that the author or the creator in general doesn't mean offense, but actually utilizes this for some other purpose in the story, except, you know, taking shots at whatever it is that is a stereotype, then I think it wouldn't be offensive. Like, for example, um, uh, some stereotypes here in in Greece of certain people from certain areas, like um, people that are... uh, hillbillies to the point where they they speak extremely fast and in a very thick accent. Like, not even other Greeks understand this. (laughs) Um, And they are very... I mean, the moment you see this character, they are extremely scientific. Like, now in Greece, they are are under extinction. You don't find people like that. But, like, uh, 50 years, 70 years ago, hundred years ago, half of them were like this, uh, because people weren't educated and stuff. Um, but the, the same character can be extremely offensive, extremely offensive, you cannot tolerate it, uh, or so funny and so amusingly entertained. Yeah, that's the same word. So, so 
amusing and entertaining that you love the character even though you know that uh, it is extremely stereotypical. Mm -hmm. So, right. Right. And, and there is uh, also the academician, the guys that speak in Archaic uh, Greek, uh, like almost uh, almost ancient Greek, like the the, the Archaic Hellenistic version of uh, of Greek, because they feel that this makes them be uh, so um, you know um, advertise that they're educated and mm -hmm. and. And they are extremely annoying <laughs> when you meet them over here. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> although every, everyone understands them, but everyone is also extremely annoying. <laughs> right. <laughs> because they are like, they are the pretentious hipster style in Greek. That's I was just it. thinking, yeah. Yeah, hipsters. Yeah, 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 yeah. It just came to me now. Um, the same thing. I mean, you can have a, a character that is hilarious because it's a point making fun of certain traits but not the demographic or you know the whole thing or they can be extremely offensive even to people that are annoyed by the academicians so mm -hmm. I think it's how you treat the stereotype in your story more than yeah. other things I, w I was thinking that in terms of Australia I mean a lot of humour can be class based like you're saying you know, with lack, mm -hmm. lack of education or whatever and say in Australia we have the kind of people who you might make fun of by using a stereotype are what we would call bogans or, you know, the people from lower socioeconomic kind of background, you know, less education. They talk very, um, their accent is very thick and the, the nuances of their speech are quite... Um, very stereotypical and very strange. You know, they'll, they'll, I'll give you an example. They'll say things like, G'day, mate. Nice day, isn't it, eh? I'm going to take a few, have a few cones, eh, mate? Eh? You know, ev everything is ending with, a, like, A eh? and, um, well, what are you doing tonight, eh? Uh, it's... <laughs> So yeah, that that's the, that's the kind of way they talk, and um, <laughs> so it's very indicative of you know a, you know coming from certain areas, having uh, you know a certain level of education and and all that kind of thing. But it it can be very cute and it can be very funny if you if you're just making fun of that in a friendly way. But if you turn this mm. into a classist kind of thing and you're making fun of a whole class of people, then it gets very offensive because you're saying anybody who has you know a certain level level of education they speak like that they're, they're all morons they're all idiots you know they're not to be respected and that that's when it gets offensive but if it's in a friendly way and if you were saying you know there's a bit of that in all of us then it it loses that offensive quality and then we can all laugh at ourselves rather than laughing yeah. at at one kind of person that's the problem at least the way I see it. I yeah, mean, that's exactly it. That's yeah. it. Because, yeah. yeah, there's there's a bit of that, that uh, pretentious ac academic in all of us as well, which we can laugh at. You know, we're not just laughing at those people. Yeah. We're laughing at that tendency. We can all be wankers, you know? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, just look at the internet where, um, where everyone, when you are in an argument, there will be at least one person saying that they are a super academic on yeah. something, so yeah. nobody should uh, <laughs> cross them or anything. Uh, oh my God! Now, like it happened in our current uh, political scene, uh, Twitter, some idiot in some minister, I don't remember who, because they are completely interchangeable at this point. <laughs> um, but he. He wrote because, uh, you know, Greeks, um, let's say they are not very politically correct when talking to politicians. Oh. We are extremely rude nowadays. Anyway, uh, so he, wa he was receiving criticism about something that was uh, innocuous and uh, completely uh, uh, lacked sense in any way and, and and his reply 
to the criticism was I have three degrees, you idiots. <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kid you not. I have three degrees, you idiots. That was that was the, yeah. the direct quote yeah. translated. Of course, then that raised the the I mean it opened the gates of internet hell because everyone went to research whether he didn't have three degrees, he didn't. And mm. yeah. <laughs> Now he's Mr. Three Degrees, <laughs> and he will never do <laughs> <leave> that. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, the old Al Gore invented the, old the old internet Gore thing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Never, never claim yeah. things that you don't have, or that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> never, never try and win an argument by claiming expertise. That's uh, that's a very bad road. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> It was hilarious, though. I have to say that I laughed a lot <laughs> that day. It's the three degrees. <laughs> three degrees of separation. <laughs> oh, what a fool. Oh. So, I was just thinking in some other ways I've sort of skirted the the causing offence thing. So in Pinky TA, you know, it's it's sort of set in the real world, but a slightly different version of the real world. But I do have, like, um, you know, the different ethnicities of people. I have uh, Afghanistan, Afghanistanis, or, you know, the mm. tribal people from those kind of regions, and um, you know, Algerians or whatever. I, I'm not sure. Tunisians, yeah, that's that's who they are. And French and, and all these kind of people. But, yeah, I've... I had to think about a way because you know they, these people that are sort of playing the bad guys in in one instance the Afghanis, but I didn't want to depict them in a stereotypical way that sort of you know says you know they're obviously bad guys because they're Afghanis. Yes, you because know, say when Pinky's uh, you know she's in prison or whatever and she kills these people to to escape. I I didn't want to do that, but I I ended up. Um, uh, completely displaying them that way so they are you know the typical uh, you know rapey kind of bad guys that, that she kills because you know she's she's the good person and the, the, the bad one well her, her, her butt is out in the wind yeah. um, in the army I mean everyone uh, is, is justified in being rapey <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but I, I, I'm still don't look at that as a high point in the comic the fact that I went to that typical kind of depiction of you know you know a situation that she's in 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 the first place which is a whole whole cliche thing you know females in in uh, you know heroic females always have to fear you know that as as a you know always as a consequence or always is out there as a threat against them which is again that that is problematic. That should not be um, a driving force in a story. Um, so that that's a that's a mark against me, as well as you know, displaying um, you know these brown people with beards uh, as as falling into that uh, as the bad guys in that situation. So again, that's a that's something mm. that if I was writing it again, I would be you know obviously these people women do face that as a threat and you know brown people as much as anyone else can be the the perpetrators but i would work in work my story in a way that didn't just naturally fall into that cliche so yeah i wouldn't sort of be using that but unfortunately i did so i'm owning up to it at least (laughs) 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 i was thinking of a of of a that not such situation but sexual aspects uh, I had the I was very nervous bridging that in in Black Moonlight a lot but um, the character that I wanted to introduce in a sense and um, again now I'm worrying of saying this on the record because that, that could be offensive like not the, the story itself, but what I'm saying right now, that that she needed to be introduced in a compromising position in a sense. Yes. Um, 
um, to show. I mean, I, I when you need when I needed to show a, a specific range of of this character um, as a signal for a lot of things that are going to come that are not sexual. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, still, it was for me how I would pick the particular sexual scene and, and what I would focus on and why and how long and uh, at what point and I mean all of this was uh, not only story wise but also I mean will my audience be offended because they would not be expecting something like that like in the normal range I don't yeah. double there but um, in a in a grimy world like this you have to play it at some point so that for me was and still I'm not sure how people really reacted to it because I didn't get that many comments <laughs> so maybe that's an answer <laughs> um, but uh, yeah I think that was uh, one of my uh, very questionably fearful to upload moments in the, in the comic yeah. more than the murder scene yeah actually. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah you, you worry about that kind of thing because you have you've set a tone and you've set like expectations and you you think that it's going outside of that to begin with yeah and yeah you have to see how your audience is going to take that so mm. it can be difficult I was thinking of say like in the old Sid's comics for example Transneptunian, death porn or whatever he doesn't have any mm. of those concerns because he's already set up a world where it doesn't matter there's there's no worries about how the audience is going to take this because it's already within those realms he doesn't care about the offence it's going to cause there's a, there's a fair warning yeah. there's a fair warning that you, you know in you know what you're going to get so <laughs> you, don't, you don't have the right to be offended yeah you, go there so and I think that's a pretty straightforward warning for that he's titled but it yeah, well. <laughs> yeah exactly like, what more do you need <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I I did want to signal like I'm uh, the, the, the world goes there but it's not going to be like something gratuitous or it will never veer to porny situations in a sense like but it is it exists and it is a plot element and it it still is going to be working as a plot element even off stage so yeah so that was a uh, risky risque let's say risque, yes <laughs> very risque <laughs> uh, I hope I hope it they got that across. Yeah, yeah. I do hope I think it it works. It works. It does. And um, we'll see how it develops further on down the line. Yeah. It's yeah. It's, I'm, I'm excited about Iris. Iris is one of my characters that I really am excited about. You see. Yeah, yeah. It's it's important to be able to do that, and you know, to have characters that you're interested in, so you can maintain your interest in the story and the plot lines mm -hmm. but yeah she, she in her in herself isn't offensive yeah but the yeah the situation i suppose could be to some people but i i don't think so i think it's introduced well enough and yeah well at some point you say okay i'm even if someone is offended that there's nothing i can do about it except that's I mean, if, if the story has to show certain things, has to show certain things. And well, we're, we're, so far, we sort of touched on things that are traditionally uh, trans could be transgressive or could cause an offence. There are other weird things as well. Um, I remember in PKTA, somebody was uh, was sort of offended by the fact that I didn't depict um, gunning procedure on a battleship correctly. And he was very, very offended. He took that <laughs> to heart. He was like, oh, God, you didn't even, oh, God, you had to do the research. Oh. And 
And then from then on, yeah, chance can be very picky that way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he he needed me to get the proper, you know, range finding and the gunnery and then the, the calculations. Jesus, Tans, I don't know. I just don't know. <laughs> that that made me know who it could have been who was offended. By that. That. Truly, that was... what's that? It's a stickless art. But that. yeah, but that made me very. After that, I had stopped um, doing the sort of the laissez-faire thing of about you know thinking, um, oh yeah, this thing goes over there, and then I have this next scene where I do this or whatever, and then I had to start thinking, okay, does, is this logically? Does this logically make sense? How would they do this? How would they get this machine from this part of the ship to that part? You know, what what would they do? You know, they have to. There has to be a logical kind of. Uh, steps, you know, they'd have to move it like with the cranes, but the cranes are blown off. So how would they do this? And so I'm, I'm, I'm so that's a good thing, right? That kind of helped you. Mm-hmm. Well, no, the, uh, it it did in a way. And, raise and, your, raise the bar a little. Bit. Yeah, it it did that, but it made me second guess myself too much and do too much research and have to worry incredibly before it's I can not, do the scene. It's not that it, thing as too much research. <laughs> You can never use it too much. <laughs> but yeah, it can be extremely time consuming though. To second guess and second and check and yeah. Yeah, because you can't make everything uh, yeah, I don't correct. know if that's offend- being offended necessarily. Like that, that doesn't sound like that person was offended necessarily. Well he was they were, that's more a cr- critique, you know, constructive uh, kind of no, no, he criticism, was criticism from what was, I'm hearing. He was acting very uh, upset that I didn't have it um uh you know, it's a proper kind of military uh procedure for for gunnery on ships, you know. He was go oh. like, You keep saying he, but you we've already revealed it was tense. <laughs> tense. Of course it was. Tense. <laughs> no, you're trying to protect her. It's very noble of you, but I I am, I am very yeah. noble. That's why so angry, Tense? Why? Why? <laughs> because uh, because I I was born angry and I <laughs> have to be angry about everything. It's what I do. I like it. It's a good answer. Yeah. Who hurt you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, re- um, the thing is that you you have you have, uh, you have trumpets in your story. How? I mean, it's not exactly true to history. I mean, it has uh, it's it's historical fiction, so to what level do you draw the historical accuracy on, on, on gun notions or whatever? I mean, come on. <laughs> so, yeah, um, well, this was a point in the story before the Trumpers, so yeah, just, that's when that, that sort of happened. But, yeah, there are other things too. I mean, say... Like, um, at one point I was worried that I wasn't representing characters with different body shapes properly, you know, I was getting into the old old cliche of, you know, just having, like, pretty pinky and, you know, all the handsome men, so that's in the, was it Pinky TA5, then I introduced, like, um, you know, a larger woman, Betty, and, you know, a few other characters, and... It started to broaden things out. I, I still worry that it's the my cast isn't racially diverse, but you know, then again, it doesn't really have to be because um, it's depicting a time from the nineteen twenties, and armies then were very, um, you know, they were just the kind of people who, like, basically, these people are Russians or Russian kind of people. They they aren't a very ethnically diverse group the kind of people that I'm depicting they they come from this small Crimean empire so yeah but I do think about that kind of thing because I don't I don't want to be you know like stereotypically just show okay the white these white guys they're they're the good guys and everyone else is a bad guy (laughs) anyone who talks in a different accent but yeah so right that that is no I mean I'm I'm a history protects me in that area like um, back then um, at least ethnically speaking Greece was 99.99 99% Greek like everyone was Greek 
Except for the, the point, king. Like, <laughs> except for the king, the king of Germany. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> or, you know, he was German and he had the Russian wife. You know, very, very, very great, all of them. Anyway, uh, I, I remember, like, up until when I was a school girl, like elementary school, ha- seeing the person that was black yeah. was a novelty, like, novelty to the point that of everyone crowding around and, uh, and observing, but not in a racist way, like, wow, look at this person, this person is, is different, and, and things like that, and we didn't really have, so back then, in the 40s, when I make this um, comic about the 40s, the, the only ethnicity you will have is Greeks and whoever has a fight them, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> um, the, the one thing I was and I still am worried about is the body shape because it's going to be a problem in my story. If I make someone chunky or, or fat, they will probably be a collaborator. So I can't. Uh, I can't even make the collaborators fat. Yeah, cause because they, they would <laughs> maybe, be the ones who had the extra food to, to be able to do exactly. that. Exactly. So exactly, right. and actually, it was an element back then. I mean, if you were from a you know body mass and up, people were suspicious. Like, where do you get all the food and how? Yeah. So, yeah, I can't really have. So you don't want to have that in your. What? Yes. So we used to put that element into your. Into your. I don't because because then they, everyone will know who the bad guys are. Yeah. And I don't uh, them. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. yeah. You, so everyone is thin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're all starved. But say for Brave Resistance, you have, like, at least you have Hackett. Yeah. No, in Brave Resistance, it's, uh, it's the different wonderful. because it's in the countryside. Like, the towns, the cities were starving. The countryside, not so much because people could get food from other sources, like uh, the. They didn't have the limitations that townspeople had. So you had people of various body shapes and sizes on all sides. So then there you can have some diversity, at least in, in body shape. So that's why Tula is, is tanky. And, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you wouldn't call her thing. And she wouldn't be. I mean, she would be heavy set and really strong. You don't want him to punch you, basically. <laughs> um, and and uh, it means nothing because she 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 can find. I mean, they didn't have limitations on 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 the diet, but they could eat in in quantity. So yeah, okay. not in the towns. Though. The towns where w- w- everyone had rations. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Less for people, and yeah, everybody is very similarly thin. What about things in in the writing itself, like the dialogue that could be offensive? Do you have to sort of think about that? You know, do you have to sort of scale back on what you'd honestly like the character, like the dirt? Well, you already said that, I suppose. The the dirty Germans, the Nazis, all that. Yeah, you already went over that. What about you, Baines? What, what's your um? The things you'd like your characters to say that would um, you'd scale back on, or I, I guess, uh, I guess I think it in ter- terms of gender because I have a cast of um, pretty homogenous characters in a certain like, I mean, sort of based on just my own background, it was a relatively homogenous. You know, so I don't have a great diversity in terms of race or anything like that, or any diversity in terms of race, really. But uh, it's a, a gender thing. There's three guys and three girls in the main cast, and the supporting cast is pretty evenly split also. So I guess I think in terms of what is my understanding of what men are like, with all the diversity that men have, on a deep, deep level, men are men. You know, and ditto with women. Like, there's a lot of diversity, of course, like much, much diversity in who we are, um, who women are. But then at a deep, deep level, there's sort of, there are gender differences. So I sort of, you know, pretty light, 
fairly shallow <laughs> kind of way I, I do my stories, but uh, the thought of what are some of the gender differences without putting people in movies, you know, like kind of kind of trying to stay if somewhat true to what I to my understanding of men and women and how they're similar, how they're different. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's sort of where a lot of thought goes, I guess. So so you wouldn't have the old uh, comedian thing of, have you ever noticed that uh, men pee standing up and women have to pee sitting down and all that kind of stuff? It, it, it goes beyond <laughs> that. That. That, was my, that was my whole, my whole <laughs> first issue of that. It was 30 pages of that. <laughs> <laughs> I had to edit I had to edit it, you know. <laughs> uh, no, it's like I'm still alive, and so like I'm sort of yeah. Try to be <laughs> try to sort of ex- explore that, I guess. But uh, I do wonder if I'm being offensive. But I I wouldn't change things to try to make all the women and be that, other than unconsciously with my sort of cultural programming or what, yeah. whatever, or my my own bias or whatever. <laughs> you know that could be there, <laughs> but I I do try to uh, yeah yeah. So it's those kind of things. What was that? Go ahead. Um, question to both of you: How about uh, bottomless wakeness? Are you? Yeah, that's where I thought we might be leading to that. <laughs> <laughs> they have There's no a good question, thing, basically. They don't have so do bottomless that. waitress is our <laughs> collaboration. It's about uh, wait. Waitresses in a diner who wear no pants. And it's kind of a comedy, I guess. <laughs> it's kind of sexy. But, uh, yeah, so what do you think? I'm just saying that for anyone who doesn't know what, what, it, you know, what it is. Well, the characters in Bottomless Waitress, um, it's, it's mainly a female kind of cast. They are the main characters. We've only got one, what, two named male characters so far but they've only just been introduced you know many pages down the line they they are not very essential so we it's mainly females that are being depicted and they fall into three main uh stereotypes so far um polly which is the older mature one jane which is the um sort of the responsible one and Francis, who is the uh, bubblehead. So, you, for a start, we have the, the three main female um, uh, cliches: maiden, mother, crone, sort of thing. We've, we've got, we've fallen right yeah. into that. <laughs> so, so we're, we're hitting, yeah. hitting all the bad notes. Yeah. But they, we, we try to make them human. At least Polly is a very human, earthy character, and she's not a, she's not really stereotype. She's um. She's cynical and she reacts to things in a way that the audience quite likes so far. I mean, we like her the most as our yeah. favorite character, and the audience likes her as well because she's she's relatable, she's saucy, she's earthy, she's very human. Um, the other two characters, Jane and Francis, not so much yet because Francis is too much of a bubblehead. She hasn't got any real character yet, and. Jane is too much of a nicey nicey kind of plain character. She hasn't got much of a um much of a personality yet either, except she just loves <laughs> she loves everything because <laughs> she loves her boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I I I mean Baines is the writer here, so he could talk about whether he's writing to, to avoid offence or Matt, I was re- really to what you're saying, unfortunately I, I, you cut out on my end. I didn't Catch after you're talking about Francis, I lost the rest of it. Well, but um, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear. You. Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, I didn't hear what you said about. Jane, but we've had conversations about Jane about how to improve her character and take her a little more than just be being the non in the middle kind of thing. Well, one thing about um, Jane was that you know we decided. To, to make her um, a, a black woman we just thought that that would be the thing and, and it wasn't we didn't sort of um, decide to give her any specific background just that's how she yeah that helps for I, the fact that she's black yeah 
that is nice visually, but we she was already, even when we didn't have a visual for these characters, she was already, I mean, to me, these are the, the three stooges, you know, yeah. Polly is Mo, Francis is Curly, Jane is Larry in the middle, who has, is just kind of the middle ground, doesn't really <laughs> with the curly hair, have a course. huge amount of, <laughs> with curly hair, yeah, <laughs> so that, to me, that's what they are, you know, but um, they're like a comedy, classic comedy trio, kind of. Um, so yeah, Jane, we she's got some stuff coming up story-wise, but yeah, we haven't really emphasized anything about her character. She does have a romantic relationship, so that does, like when I think about it, I, I do think of um, uh, like do, women wanting relationships or being or having a focus on relationships. Is I mean, I know pe- some people don't like. Like all male characters are about, or something in, in a lot of fiction. Um, so I give that some thought. I wouldn't to necessarily take it away just for that reason, because I don't really, I don't think, because I wouldn't want to, you know, to just worry about that and change things based on worrying about what someone might think. Um, everyone is offended. It's someone offended by anything, you know. So you can't really worry about it that in that sense too much. That's true. One one thing um, when when I was creating the look of the characters, um, say say for Jane, you know, she's a, a black one, but I didn't make her like like fit in into any stereotypes or any like ethnotypes that uh, that are really obvious. She just has darker skin and curlier hair and, and that kind of thing, and and you know, brown eyes. So and and she isn't written in a way that you know she says anything uh, you know in a cliche way. But another character was um, Wilfred, the scientist character, who is like a nerdy, um, a guy who is awkward with women and that kind of thing. But I didn't want to do him in a, the cliche way of drawing a kind of a fellow who is nerdy and, and awkward with women. The scientist character. I wanted to do a more realistic still comical but more realistic version of because he's a he's a he could be a geologist that's most likely what he is I mean we're not really specifying yeah he lives up in the middle of nowhere in a sort of a desert town yeah, oh, yeah so good so, chance so yeah. I've made him what I've seen of geologists kind of well the the nerdier kind uh, so he wears a cowboy shirt and he he has long hair he's tight he's <laughs> high forehead a bit of facial hair um <laughs> Yeah, but that sort of fits in the characters that I've seen myself. You know, real people rather than the the typical science nerd kind of kind of character. Uh, at least to my mind, yeah, anyway. That's great. Because I thought it'd be more more interesting and funnier to to you know to have that kind of character in that role rather than a, an absolute science cliche. Yeah. Like a total cliche, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pocket protector kind of, you know, st- stammering guy. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think that that's a great call on your part, and that he's the kind of scientist who would be digging in the dirt and looking at rocks, and he kind of is not sitting in a, a classroom or, or or sitting in a um, in a library or something like that. Yeah, I, I'm doing I, research. He's actually out there, so yeah, the way he looks makes sense. I imagine him. You know, he likes heavy metal. That's why he's got long hair. You know, <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> he has he has reasons for the way he, he likes dressing in cowboy shirts and brown brown pants because you know he he considers himself an outdoorsy type. He doesn't think he looks like a nerd at all. That's his own personal style, right? And yeah, that's that's the uh-huh. kind of thing. So yeah, that was my effort to make a, a non. But I didn't. I wasn't thinking about making him non-offensive. But I do consider those right. characters pretty offensive. <laughs> offensive, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, well, back at the at the women, awful. though. I mean, and they're all waitresses and they're all pantsless. Is that a problem? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just like women are pantsless everywhere. We're, <laughs> we're conforming to the stereotype: <laughs> pantsless women. <laughs> no, but it's putting them. It's definitely putting them in. I think, I think they're more uh, confronted. Uh, com, uh, 
con con por ah, whatever they are comfortable uh, are very, uh, from, yeah, that, uh, that the fantasy of a diner having this particular more yeah yeah which yes. can be really oh, problematic oh, oh, finally my pronunciation <laughs> is there. conforming uh, <laughs> that, that could be problematic if you're drawing a fantasy character who conforms to a, you know a male fantasy or whatever then you can run into the problems of you know um, creating offensive stereotypes. So, but I, I don't. As a man, I really can't. can't I, if say I felt like we were looking down, if we were being down on the characters, I guess that's where I would, I would want to adjust. Um, my tendency would be not to adjust what we're trying to do, yeah. for fear of offending someone. You know. <laughs> To have certain things in mind, but uh, to sort of try to like eliminate anything that might upset someone, I, I wouldn't want to do that. Like, why? What would be the point? You know, yeah. of writing anything. Yeah, yeah, not not being too sensitive in it, second guessing the audience and all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, but we don't intend. There's... to... To... No, yeah, I think, no, it's I not intended to be. Like, I mean, I really love these characters. I really do all of them. You know, yeah. uh, we do have a sort of lesbian character upcoming. Who, I, I mean, yeah, there, I mean, we could ask those questions. Like that character potentially could be offensive. Exactly. I think it uh, again. It depends on the way you script the character, because like I judge from myself, I'm on the spectrum of uh, of audience tolerances, I would say that I am towards the prudish side. <laughs> and there are things that I don't like to see and stuff. And certainly, if you ask me yeah. out of context uh, what I would think about like a diner with uh, pantsless women like being basically the inverse version of Hooters, uh, I wouldn't like it. But the way it is uh, presented and the way definitely it is delivered and script-wise doesn't make me feel bothered by it. It's like a gimmick that I expect it to be used for situations and little episodes and uh, things that aim to something else and not, for example, simple fantasy or simple objectification and things like that. And that way I find it fun. Mm. So I do think that it really depends on the way you write something. I mean, you can write anything, the most offensive thing, and it will not be offensive if if you know how to do it. Yeah. Otherwise, like, uh, it right. would become... Like, for example, if you if you take the thumb from what I have here, I haven't followed the whole thing. I I don't double that neatly. This is insane. But um, there are a lot of things that if someone else was saying, they would be at least considered and debate. But because Trump is saying them the way he is saying them, they immediately become super offensive and super. Uh, intolerable in a sense I think it really is a matter of delivery on, on a lot of things on a lot of things and then um, yeah. you yeah. would say that you know part of propaganda is on how things are, are delivered in the first place so if you can spin anything in a way in, in, uh, in a presentable way it really comes down to how you utilize everything yeah yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, your presentation, that, that is yeah, very important. You, things can be um, made. Oh, God, I can't. My voice is coming back at me. It's driving me insane. Um, yeah, something's echoing. Yeah. <laughs> things, can be, things can be presented in ways, the same thing can be presented in a way that makes it incredibly offensive or that makes it very benign. It just depends on how it's done and it takes a certain skill in order to be able to 
to show you know either way sometimes people do intend to make things very offensive in the in that mm-hmm. well you know, we all know people in arguments they do that you know they'll twist facts around or twist what you say in order to make you sound very evil and and, and like a terrible person or you know yeah. other people will say no that that wasn't offensive at all and they, they will take things in a different way yeah so Although that that does come down to say your, well not not just your presentation, but say your audience can take things in different ways. Some people can take the same thing in a totally different way, and some and other people can take it like they they can see nothing wrong with it. So yeah. that's yeah. a big factor as well. You never know. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah if, I've if definitely read stuff. Uh, go ahead, Chance. No, I was just going to say that if people are looking to be offended, like they have motivation to be offended, they will find something. I mean, there is no way, even if the most, some people might even be offended that you are super politically correct. Like, uh, they, they, if they want to be offended, they will be. There is nothing you can do about it. If there is a motivation yeah. to call you, in a sense. Yeah, yeah, that- that's true. There will be certain. There's things. a thing of an element of hypersensitivity and hyper offensiveness that you sometimes wonder. I'm talking about on the larger internet. You know, we were all aware of that. I'm sure, mm-hmm. where it's like you wonder: are, are you actually offended? Or are you like a social justice warrior or something who's like sort of mm-hmm. portraying themselves as offended? But you know, it's really, you know, it's kind of there's a n- non genuine sort of thing to it or something. Or they will feel offended on behalf um, of someone. Right. They're portraying themselves as some kind of uh I don't know. Well they they will oh, help me out. <laughs> I can't talk. <laughs> they they will portray themselves as as the defender of some group. They will set themselves up as as the proxy right. you know the 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 defender and um, the white knight of of some group and they'll come to the rescue and they'll they'll uh, you know decide what is and, offensive you know, and what the moral high ground that you know nobody else can touch because they are super pure yeah. and yeah. yeah they have come down to judge <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's worth mentioning. You know, that thing is worth mentioning because you don't want to start to worry as a writer about pandering and being and having no one get upset. That are like stories could you possibly have? It, they would suck. You know, it's it's impossible. There'd be nothing there. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's impossible to guard against that because yeah, um, and anybody can be offended by anything, and there's always something in there that. Uh, that can cause a problem for someone if yeah. they're motivated. If yeah. it's motivated offense, then everybody is going to be offended. Yeah, I had a, I had a couple of people. Uh, this is not from my comic side of things. This is from my novel side side of things. Like for my trilogy, uh, fantasy story. The fantasy story has uh, fictional nations that I don't particularly focus on on the race on, I mean because they, I specifically made them all I mean they are nations but they, I made them all the same race for a very specific reason that uh, I wanted to explore in the particular trilogy and I got uh, of, uh, offended people telling me that I don't have representation of all the races in a fantasy world where there is no other race. There is a single race. But that's it. It's a single race and it's just different, different nations. And uh, and then I got another uh, guy that was offended that I had uh, women have uh, roles that um, were too active. I had a guy that was offended that some other women in the story, in the cast, had very domestic roles. Uh, I am, and then I had also a guy that was offended that there was no, absolutely no sex in, in the entire trilogy. <laughs> and had, no, that, and that was, was me. That was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I, I was trying to not say it was you. I'm <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm sorry I got so angry. Yeah, about that. yeah, you know, the, and and uh, that person forgot that everyone is being narrated from the point of view of a girl that is 13 years old and reaches up to like uh, 16. So it's somewhat unlikely that she would pick in other people's bed bed chambers. <laughs> um, <Yeah>. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah, okay, you don't take into account these things. Simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. There's, you cannot please everybody. You, you've just got to... All you can do is just keep in mind the kind of tone you're wanting to do. You know, have you the new comic, whether it's going to be something like El Cid's uh, Death Porn or whether it's going to be something that's that's more open to a more a, a wider majority of people to, to view. And you know, just keep in mind obvious traits and obvious things. You know, you don't want to make your females too... You know, fall into outdated cultural stereotypes. You don't want to have like ethnic stereotypes there that that are offensive and making fun of fun of people in a, a classist kind of way. You, you um, if you're doing a broad appeal comic, you know, if it's if it's something strange or a very niche, then you know, do whatever you want. But just be aware that it's it's only going to have a particular kind of audience, and you are going to turn off everyone else. So. Is that? Yeah. Well, I think we've covered this this pretty general. Uh, a little bit of an awareness of what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Overall, always context. It's always mm-hmm. context and audience you know. as well. It's not necessarily never do that, never do that. Awful. Just you can't you can't say that. You know, yeah. it's just not. But uh, it's interesting. An, an audience, yeah, you've. you've I've offended. That's like even ones that I. Sorry, I think we have a delay. Yeah, we do. I, well, I'm just saying, audience as well. You, you've got to keep in mind um, the audience your work is for. Um, mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, I've been offended by stuff, like if, and I'm just kind of feel it. Like even comments that I, I like. I've been put off like there'll be some twist or some turn or, or something goes off, off and I kind of just yeah. stopped reading it yeah. yeah it does happen yeah me too me too yeah there, there are comics that I don't read because they um they're definitely not my thing you know but I don't I don't make a complaint to the author and saying you know you should change this so I will read it. <laughs> that's better. That's better. That's a better way to put yeah. it. It's just not my thing. Yeah, like I just say that. Ah, that's where it's going. It's not really for. I just kind of. Yeah, I don't complain about it either. Yeah, yeah. most people probably wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it turns you off. You just you know pick away. You don't need to throw the person or go into a rage or something. So. Right. Because that, that's like a click away from music, from from what happened in the movie music. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. yeah. <laughs> Very much. Well, I've I have even featured. Comments. How many authors have we hobbled? <laughs> How many? We don't talk. We don't talk about that. I've I've even oh. featured comics that that do not appeal to me or go they uh, do things that are outside my comfort zone quite a few because I think that's important yeah. to represent things that don't just that do not just represent my point of view that that show things you know, that, that, that have a bit more diversity yeah. of, of points of view and you know ideas and so, so I do, and I read. I do force myself to read comics that I do find, you know, a little bit offensive to to my way of thinking, and or you know, they don't gel with with my point of view at all. But yeah, I'll still read all the way through them just to do features. Although I don't read them for pleasure, those ones. But. And I gotta think that because you that that's a what is that in in your life? Like do you say that's that benefit. Or a net loss. It's got to be a benefit, right? I suppose. You know, sort of skills <laughs> of you and stuff. Yeah. I suppose. <laughs> Other than getting your features done, I mean, that's a that's a good thing to sort of have a, a larger understanding, right? And just a larger well, yeah, a larger understanding. Sort of pool of experience. 
they wouldn't they don't change the way I think and they don't change my point of view but I do understand why right. those people think that way and why they would you know put that into a comic so mm-hmm. it helps me understand or even understand that point of view even if it, sure yeah exactly yeah and that's not stuff you would read for pleasure obviously in most cases some of them, yeah but uh, it's still yeah that's good man it's important. what else is art for and to sort of have different you know points of view precisely that's a it's a good thing the bottomless point of view that's what we've got to Presentable yes. to everyone. <laughs> Change the world. <laughs> Change the world. Yes, that doesn't apply. None of this applies to bottomless waitress. Everyone has to read it. <laughs> and they love it. Nothing applies. Not even pants. Well Exactly. I, I think we've covered everything then. That's uh we we're, we're an hour and a quarter. Um in Oh dear. Time. So yeah, we we've, we've a long oh. one this time, but we had a good conversation from nothing it's interesting interesting stuff for nothing yeah. all right well thank you guys for being part of quick 286 uh, thank you now get out there and offend people yes yeah <laughs> all right bye-bye everyone bye-bye